we've had prayer and our topic this morning is I love the Lord. So we began with a cosmic battle and uh, why don't we just read not totally the conclusion but we're, we're going to Revelation 12. You know, we began, this is a mystery. How could there be a battle between God and Satan? I mean, isn't God so much stronger than Satan? I mean, well, it depends on what you mean by strong. Uh, uh, Christ, God, draws his people to him with love. Satan with deception. And there are so many mysteries. It's beyond our comprehension. If we went just back a little ways here, and uh, verse 5, I, I'm sorry, chapter 5 of Revelation, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I turned around to see this lion. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. And if you went to back to Revelation 20, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> 22. He showed me a pure river, verse 1, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And I think you know that's not H2O. Uh, the Bible does use metaphors and so forth. Uh, and uh, when you take the bread and the cup, in remembrance of Christ, that is not his body and blood. It's a symbol, and we do this in remembrance of him. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Wow. Adam and Eve got thrown out of the garden, lest they should eat of the tree of life and live forever. And here it is. I don't know whether that's the same one. I rather think it is. Uh, the tree of life, which bare 12 men or fruits. I don't understand this. I mean, we're in glorified, resurrected bodies. This is an eternity. So we're talking in, in mystery language here, but it's something that God wants to reveal to us. Bear 12 men or fruits and yield her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Why do they need healing? I don't understand it. But our focus is on the, the Lord. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So the throne of God to the very end is the throne of God and of the Lamb. I don't know how much... Uh, we'll be able to talk about that. But the lion of the tribe of Judah is the lamb. And he, he is there as though he had just been slain. Uh, well, so let's go. Where, where, where did I say we were first reading? Chapter 12, wasn't it? Okay, so we talked about uh, there is a cosmic war going on. It is for control of the universe. Seems amazing. 
Why does God still have to fight with Satan for control of the universe? Well, it's not a Star Wars battle with weapons of mass destruction. It's something deeper than that. And so verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and the dragon fought with his angels. That's, uh, I mean, I, we just don't have time. The Bible says so much in a few words. Why would you find dragons everywhere all over the east if you've traveled there? On the temples and so forth. Why do you find serpents? Uh, well, I can't launch off into that. But Satan loves to be called a dragon. He's not ashamed to be called the serpent. He loves to be the serpent. The great dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Praise God. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. Wow, he's the deceiver. He deceives the whole world. And was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And we saw that as we began in Job. Here comes the sons of God appearing before God, and it says, And Satan came with them. Wow. He's like, a, as I mentioned, he's like a lame duck president. He still has access to the White House, <laughs> but uh, not for long. But still he has power, and he can go there, and he has authority. And Satan has authority, and he can enter right into the very throne of God. Wow. And I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven, let me read it again. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And then it turns focus on us because we have a very important part to play in this battle. It's a battle for the souls, for the heart, the mind of man. And what was our part? <laughs> they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. As, as we mentioned, I don't, I, I'm sure Satan doesn't understand. He still doesn't understand. He, look what he offers mankind. Follow me. And you'll have all the free sex you want, all the drugs and, all, you know, everything. And how could they resist it? And look what he offers. I think of that poem, and I, I'm tempted, but I won't. But uh, how, how many of you have ever heard On the King's Highway, the poem? It was on the King's Highway near a century ago that a preacher stood the noble birth telling the fallen and low of a Savior's love and a home above and a life and a peace and a joy they all might know while slow through the crowd a lady proud her gilded chariot drove. Make way! I'll, I'll begin to cry. Make way, cried the haughty outrider. You're blocking the king's highway. Our lady is late and their majesty's wait. Give way there, good people, I pray. But the preacher heard, and his soul was stirred, and he cried to the driver, Nay, it says the king's highway, but I hold it today in the name of the king of kings. 
And then it goes on, and and he gives, he says, I, there's a an auction for this woman's soul, for all she has, and he. <clears throat> says, I see three bidders, the world steps up at the first, then Satan and so forth, and they tell what they're offering, and then the third bidder, and what hast thou to offer, thou man of sorrows unknown? He gently said, my blood, I'm careful with my language, please don't sing songs where it says Jesus shed his blood. Jesus did not shed his blood. Men shed his blood. That's just a little mistake there on the part of the author. I gave my blood. What is thou to offer, thou man of sorrows unknown? He gently said, my blood was shed to purchase her for my own. To conquer the grave and her soul to save. I trod the wine press alone. And then it goes on. And um, she's converted. <clears throat> she takes off her jewels and her coronet and so forth and lays them at the, as it were, at the Savior's feet. So uh, Satan thinks he, he, he's, he's, he's going to win. Look what he offers. What does Jesus offer? Well, you're not of the world. I've chosen you out of the world because you're not of the world. The world will hate you. I'm offering you, if you want to follow me, take up the cross. Follow me. That's where we're going. Uh, well, I mean, surely Satan thinks he's going to win this battle. What he has what he has to offer. So, we come to the climax uh, all over the Bible, but and we don't have time to turn to it, but Job 13, 15, you remember that verse. What does Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So, Job was an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb. And uh, 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. I love the Lord. Why do I love him? There's got to be some reason. Well, a lot of reasons. Have you told him today, other than in the songs we've been singing, I love you, Lord. <laughs> you should tell him over and over. Uh, I, I don't want to be critical. Let me just make a contrast between what we were singing down from his glory and then one of those lighter things that they're trying to beat uh, deep. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. What about getting the Lord to rejoice? Take joy, my king, in what you hear. What has he heard? May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Uh, what was the sweet, sweet sound? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be critical. But what have we heard so far? Down from his glory ever-living story, my God and Savior came and Jesus was his name and so forth. Amazing. It's praise to the Lord. We praise praise. We love love. I'm sorry. In our songs, we sing about love. We sing about praise. But where is the Lord? It should be about him and it should... Cause us to fall at his feet. Okay, so the first commandment. Well, I see I wrote my wife's name down here. And so I should at this point, you know, I tell her every day. 
And I tell her, Ruth, I love you more today than before. You're beautiful. What are these wrinkles? You are beautiful. And I love you so much. Well, you ought to tell your wife, your spouse, whatever. But we need to tell the Lord. There's a commandment. First, well, not the first commandment, but we don't have time to go into that. What is the first commandment? Be fruitful and multiply. Not don't eat of this tree. It kind of rules out homosexuality, but uh, they have broken the very first command God gave. They have thumbed their noses at God. And I don't know how they could have gay pride parades because if everybody adopted their lifestyle, it would be the end of the human race. Oh, we're so proud. Well, okay. Uh, but it is a command. Thou shalt love, because Jesus said, they asked, what's the first and great command? Jesus said, the first commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And the second is like unto it, thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, verse 37. How can it be loved if it's commanded? And we've mentioned some of these atheists. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, very brilliant, Jewish, uh, uh, raised as a Christian, and uh, really talks in fond terms of his Sunday school teacher way back there. But he hates the Lord. And this is one of the things he would say. He calls, he calls God that heavenly dictator up there. He says we got to love him. But at the same time, we're supposed to fear him. Now, how are you going to work that out? Well, he doesn't understand. But how can love be commanded? Well, I, I wish that we had time to talk about it. Uh, it's a command. It's a command that we should love our neighbors ourselves. We certainly ought to love our spouse. I've talked to preachers. I can't love her anymore. What? How could that be possible? You stand before witnesses, promise your undying love till death do us part, or was it until some cute bond do us part? Uh, if a man loves me, he will keep my commandments. And I love Psalm 27, uh, Psalm of David, and I won't go on and quote the whole thing. But uh, David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. What do I know of the beauty of the Lord? I think about that a lot. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David wanted to know more of the Lord. He failed the Lord miserably. He went into grievous sin. But, well, you ladies have to be very careful too. Because you can... Uh, dress yourself or whatever in a way that attracts men be careful and I don't know what Bathsheba was doing out there bathing herself naked right where the king could see her but she was a temptress uh, so we can't blame it all on David David says I want to behold the beauty of the Lord why do I love him? He's beautiful. And, and you think of Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1.17. We don't have time to turn to these places, but we should. Because there's something so powerful here.
Well, <clears throat> Paul tells us, verse 15, I cease not to pray for you, and verse 16, and, and notice what he's, his prayer is, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And the psalmist, the apostles, cry out, Oh, that I might know him. And you know what keeps us from knowing him? And being like him? And John gives that to us in 1 John 3. When we see him, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. Now we see through a glass darkly. Lord, I don't even, I don't know you. I wish I knew, knew you better. But it's beyond our ability. But one day, the veil is removed. Our blindness of our hearts and eyes is gone. We see it suddenly. Wow! This is Jesus as he really is. And that is going to transform us. So he says, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened. We need understanding. And uh, my goodness, everything starts me on another sermon. Uh, uh, but if, if you went to Matthew 13, the sower goes forth to sow. The first seed falls by the wayside, remember? And the birds of the air come and pluck it. And uh, uh, the disciples, they don't understand the parable at all. And they, they say, well, Lord, tell what, what does this mean? And what about these birds plucking up the seed? And Jesus says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom... And what? Understandeth it not. We're not trying to just talk people into something. They've got to understand what they're getting into. That's what Jesus said. Take up the cross, follow me. This is not a beautiful trip that you're going on for some vacation or something. Uh, this is going to be an arduous journey. The straight gate, the narrow way. So he wants us to understand. And he says, then when they hear the word and they don't understand, then comes the wicked one and takes out of the heart the seed that was sown. We've got to get people to understand. Anyway, this is Paul's prayer. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Wow. He's got an inheritance in us. We have an inheritance in him. Um, it's going to be glorious for all eternity. But this is the verse I was thinking. Well, verse, verses 19 and 20. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? What would you think of the greatest expression, the greatest demonstration of God's power? Wow, when I behold your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars you've made, or we sing... How great thou art, you know. Uh, what is it? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Uh, I don't fathom that. Uh, uh, I get some inkling of it. This is the greatest demonstration of God's power that he could reach, that he could save sinners. Those who hate him, that Christ would die for them, and that somehow he would pay the penalty. And uh, again, that's something that I've discussed it with philosophers or whatever. 
I mean, this is not just. A, the guilty man is punished for the innocent? No. The innocent man is punished for the guilty. And that brings forgiveness? How can the innocent pay for the sins of the guilty? It's not just, how is that going to do anything uh, for God or for anybody? Well, Paul tells us, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. It wasn't just that Christ died, we died in him. I don't know how God works that out, but I can tell you, we have, haven't we experienced it? Wow, something happened to me. Uh, what is that song we sing that comes from Africa? I cannot tell what the, the, what the Lord has done for me. I cannot tell it all. And so forth. We can't tell it, but he did something that transformed us that Satan doesn't understand. We were born again through faith in Christ when we accepted him as our Savior. And we recognized that he died for me. He died for us in my place. That does something. Uh, the, the power, the exceeding greatness of his power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Wow. That's what God accomplished. Satan doesn't understand it to this day. And he probably never will. Um, but he, he will taste the consequences of it. Well, I was going to say a few words about Islam because it is growing everywhere. But I don't want to get into that. But well, let me just give you one contrast. Uh, you know, I've probably forgotten I don't know Arabic. La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulu Allah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You either repeat that or it is off with your head. Wherever they can do it. And they don't care. You don't even have to believe it. That's one of the things that Islam glories in. You don't even have to believe it. Just repeat the words. That's all Allah wants. What does the Bible say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Uh, and uh, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Well, if thou shalt confess Allah and Muhammad with your mouth, that's okay. If thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and what? Believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. And you remember what Jesus said? He's quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting God speaking to Israel. You honor me with your lips. You draw nigh to me with your mouth. But your heart is far from me. In vain you worship me. Well, he wants reality, and uh, so I was going to say a little more, but we don't have time for that. But I think you get the picture. Islam is spread by the sword. Now, I wish I could reason with some Muslims. Is someone, are they convinced Well, I sometimes say it like this facetiously. Islam is peace. And if you deny it, we'll kill you to prove it. Uh, well, 
I don't, you know, let's talk about shotgun weddings, but we won't go into that. Uh, they don't even bother with that anymore, but uh, you don't bring, you don't drag your bride to the altar by her hair and with a shotgun, with a gun in one hand and say, you will marry me and you will promise to love me. That's not the way it works. <laughs> you haven't won her heart. And God is not going to get us to heaven by threats, by love. This, this battle is going to be won by love. Over the deep, deep love of Jesus. Yeah, so it's a mystery. I'm crucified with Christ. Something happened. When I met Jesus, I was born again by the Spirit. And He's promised us something. And we read it in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. But let's go to, well, Paul is praying that these people will know the hope of his calling. I think we referred to this a little when we talked about the message. If you go to uh, 1 Peter, chapter 5, and Verse 10, well, what is this hope of his calling? But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So the God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory. Wow. And this is not going to be very edifying, but I was just going to, by contrast, because we talked about atheists. Atheism is uh, materialism. There's nothing but matter. And we talked a bit about that. But listen to Francis Crick. Atheist, co-discover the DNA alphabet. I don't know, we didn't quote this yet, did we? Uh, listen to what he says. You, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Isn't that wonderful to know? It is meaningless. It is hopeless. What is the hope that the atheist offers? Well, a quiet grave at the worst. Uh, Bertrand Russell. Listen to him. All the labor of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the death of the solar system. It couldn't be said more clearly. There's nothing. All, one day, all the dreams, all the corporate ambition, and all the monuments man has built, the skyscrapers and, and all the libraries will be burned up. They're gone like sand castles washed into a cosmic ocean of nothingness. What did it all matter? So you have to ask the atheist, why, Richard Dawkins, why, why do you work so hard? Why do you write so many books? They're all going to be burned up. Uh, why do you struggle to stay alive a little longer so that you can pin a few more words to the glory of the molecules? And Sagan the Pagan, you remember? Cosmos. Oh, when he got in the presence of the cosmos. <sighs> the cosmos. And what could he tell you? Do you want to know 
who you are. Well, you've got nitrogen, you've got hydrogen cells in your body that once were part of a distant star system, and they're in your body. And one day, some of the molecules in your body, they'll be out there in another star system. I think that's insanity. It's a form of insanity that is cloaked in, well, it comes with pride, and they got a good dose of it. Um, well, let me give you a little contrast. Here's Werner von Braun. He was a German space scientist, remember? He became the founder and director for many years of NASA's Space Flight Center. He was always eager to testify. Listen to what he said. Manned space flight has opened a tiny door for viewing the awesome reaches of space, an outlook through this peephole at the vast mysteries of the universe should only confirm our belief in the certainty of its creator. I cannot understand a scientist who does not acknowledge the presence of a superior rationality behind the existence of the universe. Yeah, and I think I told you, but I'll remind you so you can pass it on to others who don't know. Uh, I forget which Apollo it was. The first to circle the moon, you remember? And they sent a message back to planet Earth. We've got a message for you. <laughs> I love it. And they read the first ten verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. And then this wicked woman, Madeline Murray O'Hare, she got that banned. No more of this stuff uh, from space. Uh, and then you remember the first food and drink that was taken, consumed on the moon. You all remember, I hope. This is good to let the atheists know Oh, no, no scientists believe in God. I mean, these men are scientists. It was the bread and wine of communion. How about that? Well, God is being glorified. And uh, the poor atheist, he, he just doesn't, doesn't understand. But God has something wonderful uh, for those who love him. I has not seen nor ear heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Listen to Richard Dawkins uh, once again. Well, I'll give you a cosmologist, an atheist. I mean, this is the hopelessness of the atheist. Um, he writes, this is Ed, Ed Harris, tens of billions of years pass in the growing darkness of a universe condemned to become a galactic graveyard. That's what they have to look forward to. Daniel says, we will shine as the stars uh, of, of the firmament. Well, I would say this, what I just read, this quote from Edward Harris, that epitaph, of course, is pronounced in advance upon everything that Bertrand Russell wrote, everything that Dawkins did or wrote. Uh, and why, why, why do they insist? I want to convert you to atheism. I want you to hate God. And I want you to have this beautiful future lying ahead of you. What a hope we give you. Expending such a great effort to extend their life merely to stave off death a short while longer in order to leave some meaningless record of one's having been there. But there's no record, nothing, nothing left of all the proud structures that man has built. Listen to Dawkins again, I'm sorry. I just want to do this for a contrast. He writes, we are staggeringly lucky. 
Now you saw Dawkins on the screen. You saw the pitiful, wow, and you were laughing. It was pitiful. We're staggeringly lucky, however brief our time in the sun, if we waste a second of it or complain. Couldn't this be seen as a callous insult to those unborn trillions who will never be offered life in the first place? See, they didn't get into the right space in the gene pool and they were sloughed off. Uh, but uh, you made it in the lottery and here you are. Your genes brought you here. He says, the knowledge that we have only one life should make it all the more precious. The atheist view is life affirming and life enhancing. No, but we say it a little bit differently. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Because we have something that's going to last. But they have nothing like this. I love the Lord because he's heard my cry, the psalmist said. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. And in eternity we'll praise him. Uh, go to 1 John chapter 4 verse for ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now you can't turn that around and say love is God. God is love. It doesn't. It's saying more than God loves. Uh, it's saying that the very essence of God's being is love. God is love. We don't understand it. I certainly don't understand it. But then you get to verse 19. I think we quoted it already. We love him because he first loved us. I love you, Lord. Why do we love the Lord? Spend a little time in his presence, beholding the beauty of the Lord. Get to know him. Uh, what are we saying? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? And you remember the testimony, of, I think I mentioned, of Ravi Maharaj, the ex-guru. We wrote the book, Death of a Guru. Uh, and he, came, he was taken to this old dance hall that was paint chipped and run, you know, falling off. And he heard an orchestra. Did I tell you that story? I, I didn't. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and uh, I hope to see Robbie in, in a week or two here. We get down to Southern California to be with our grandchildren. I haven't seen for quite a while. Well, he worshipped, well, he was being worshipped as God by the, his followers, young guru. And um, his cousin, Christer, well, his name was Krishna, changed his name to Christer when he became a Christian. He got his PhD in religious studies from Harvard. And he said they tried every way they could to destroy my faith. That's Harvard. Uh, once it was a, it was founded as a Christian uh, university, 
And so his brother, I mean his cousin, Christer, uh, took him to this little meeting. Robbie had come to the conclusion that the gods he worshipped were out to kill him. They were going to destroy him. And, uh, well, you better get Death of a Guru. It's a fantastic story. And tens of thousands, really, of Hindus. It's a bestseller in all 14 language, uh, Hindu languages, uh, in Indian languages, I believe. Uh, or it has been. And uh, Christer had brought him to this old building with a paint peeling off and so forth. And he thought there was an orchestra in there. Just a huge crowd of people. They got in there. I think he said there was an audience of about 15 and the orchestra was this little girl with a tambourine. <laughs> but he never heard people, sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. No, he said, my heart is filled with darkness. <sighs> you don't sing about how you love Krishna. You don't sing about how you love, certainly, Shiva, the destroyer. You don't sing about your love for Muhammad uh, or Allah. But these people, who are they? What's happened to them? And what a love they have for this God they serve and worship and this Jesus who died for them. And uh, eventually, he was on his knees before uh, the preacher who happened, happened to be a, a, a former Muslim, uh, a school teacher. And, you know, he didn't have to have some exorcism. He said as soon as he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the one who died for his sins, whew, tons of dark things went out of him. Uh, well, something happened to us. We love the Lord. I love the Lord because he's heard my cry. I love him because he first loved me. How could you not love him? Meditate. Think a little bit. Spend time in his presence uh, and uh, get to know him. And I'm speaking to my, to my own heart. It's amazing what God can do in our hearts if we allow him. There is nothing like it. It's the new birth. We're born from above, born of the Spirit of God when we, we believe the gospel message. And remember, we quoted uh, either Friday or Saturday, I don't remember. We were talking about the DNA. It's in words. There's no life, no physical life without words, remember? And there is no spiritual life without words. If the DNA is the instruction manual for building the body and so forth. But there's no spiritual life without words. And you know what they are. First Peter chapter 1. Being born again by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Why do we preach the gospel? Because if they don't have a transformation and the word of God doesn't come into their hearts and they don't understand it and they don't realize who they are, who they are in sin and who Christ is and why he came and believe this. You know, you, you, you don't come to God as that proud lady driving in her chariot with all of her jewels and, 
and their majesty's weight and so forth, we come as broken sinners, recognizing our guilt and our need of Christ. And just a couple of reminders, because the Bible is so clear. The wages of sin is death. Well, that's what Dawkins is reaping. That's what Sagan the pagan reaped. That's what the cosmos gave him. Death. The cosmos finally all dead. The wages of sin is death, but it's worse than that. Because the second death is the lake of fire. And it goes on forever and forever and forever. An eternal dying with regret and remorse. How could I have been such a fool? I didn't need to be here. Christ died for me. He paid the penalty for my sins. And here I am because I rejected him. No hope. Uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I, I don't know most of you here, but let me just remind you what a gift is. <clears throat> the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. If you are going to receive forgiveness, if you're going to receive eternal life from God, you are going to receive it as a gift. A gift. That, what does that mean? You can't work for it. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. Somebody offers you a gift. You say, let me pay for it. A lot of people are trying to pay for the gift of God with church membership, good deeds, uh, penance, or whatever. If you try to get to heaven on your works to show God church membership, oh, I, I belong to this big church or whatever, it doesn't matter. You come, everybody's on the same level. We come as hopeless, lost sinners for whom Christ died willing to receive a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. You don't want a gift? You want to work for it? You want to earn it? You want to show God how good you are and that you deserve it? Sorry. You're going to receive this as a gift. And you can't pay for a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He can't give it to you any other way, only because Christ paid the penalty for our sins. And it always says it that way. Through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. Well, I've wandered on a long time here, and I think I'm just about supposed to be done. And... Um, So let's just kind of summarize what's been going on here, at least from my standpoint. But the others have been bearing it out. We are in a cosmic battle for the universe. And, and we've read the end of the story, of course. War in heaven. Satan and his demons, his angels, are fighting against Michael and his angels. And Satan does not prevail and he's thrown out because the lion of the tribe of Judah who defeats them all what? he's the lamb a slain lamb is on the throne wow you think about it you ponder it but oh the deep deep love of Jesus I love the Lord because he first loved me. I don't want to forget the Father because the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He knew what was going to happen. He knew his Son would be mocked and hated, spat upon, crucified. And 
you see that, oh, I'm going to launch off into another sermon here, but, but you see it so beautifully in Genesis 22, and I love it when, when you see these things in the Old Testament, and remember, God calls Abraham, I want you to kill your only son, the son you love. What a picture of Christ. The Father sent the Son. The Father giving his Son to be the Savior of the world. And remember the Son says, well, I've got the wood, Father. So he wasn't a little tiny kid. Come on, come along here, Isaac. Come along. We're going up this mountain. He was carrying the wood for the fire as Jesus carried the cross. Here's the wood. You got the fire. Where's the lamb? God will provide himself a lamb. And But I love that verse. So they went both of them together. Abraham and his son. It was a joint operation. So we don't want to forget God the Father who gave his son. Christ who suffered for our sins. They went both together. Father. For more information about the Berean Call, contact us at P.O. Box 7019, Bend, Oregon, 97708. Call our toll-free order number, 1-800-937-6638. That's 1-800-937-6638. Or visit our website at www.thebereancall.org.